Yo, yo, yo. Good morning. Well, it's morning for me. It's not morning for you because this is a video that's going up on YouTube. So who knows what time it is for you? It could be morning, could be afternoon, could be evening. Um, or maybe this is the future and we don't call things morning, afternoon, and evening anymore because we live in like futuristic pods where time doesn't matter because we're like Wally people. Um, and so it's always simultaneously morning, afternoon, and evening all at once, all at the same time. Um, cause everything is simulated and we just kind of sit back and use our brain interfaces to move through the world and do stuff. So time isn't real. Um, so if that's the case, what's up future people? Uh, good to good to see that some of you made it um i hope i'm dead um what's up <sighs> last night last night yesterday yesterday afternoon whatever um sasar so came over to my house and we streamed a little uh, post game little tu con post game session um it was really good uh we streamed for about three and a half hours covered a lot of ground um but the last hour and a half or so um was a more like um more focused on like him and his project and, and his history and his kind of relationship to theory to politics to organizing and, and all this stuff um and i it was interesting and it was good and it was actually unexpected um well i mean we had talked about it before he came over like him wanting to like go into his history and kind of uh, break that down a little bit. Um, I, but I guess I didn't expect um, what little contribution I made to, to that part of the conversation. Uh, I didn't, I, yeah. Um, you know, it kind of happened in the moment, um, but it was good. Um, so we, we, we did the TU con post game and later, later today, this evening, um, I'll be bringing on another to you gone host and, and we'll be doing a similar reflection, similar post game session, um, about to you con and who knows where that will go so far. The ones I've done, uh, have been amazing. Um, I really enjoy, um, looping back into like these digital conversations, um, what we've been able to take from like the, the physical, uh, embodied relationship. So I spend so much time talking with Dave and Mikey. Um, and I, I guess like, I guess I'm lucky. I guess I am privileged in that way that first of all, we, we seem to have hacked our mainframe. Um, so that we, we can get like a type of fulfillment from our, like our digital communication. Um, when, you know, when we have long calls, long streams, um, long mess, long backs and forths in the DMS and in the messages and stuff like that. Like, I think we're lucky and, and we're privileged that we are able to have very substantial communication in that form, but we're also lucky because we have had time with each other in the real world. And, and so we, we do have like that feedback into the digital, um, and so, yeah, we're lucky, we're privileged. And I think, I, I guess it's something I've been taking for granted, but having this opportunity to do it. And even like with, even with Cadell, like we spent a lot of time with Cadell over the American Idiots tour. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to do that. And, and I guess I'm privileged enough that um, it's just something I take for granted. Like I do allow that to feed back into like the, what, what conversation and, and communication we have online. Um, but I guess it's something I just take for granted. It's, it's something that, that happens to me that I benefit from that I don't see. Um, so, so I'm happy for that. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. But on the back end of TUCon, I guess it's just really becoming really evident to me um, because it's happening with other people now. Um, and, uh, it's cool. It's really cool. So I'm, 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 I'm really enjoying doing these conversations. I really do. 
uh, hope to keep these conversations going. Um, so that's going to be cool. Uh, you're, you're not going to want to miss um, later tonight. Our, our third post game conversation. And then hopefully this week we will get uh, actually I'll hopefully today get the the fourth post post game conversation locked in and uh and that'll be done hopefully soon and then um and we'll go from there but i'm enjoying them have, i'm having tons of fun um but the end of yesterday's stream um was different it, it wasn't uh two con post game content it was something else and dave yesterday posted uh reposted this piece why i am not a marxist um and it's a good piece i remember um talking about it like when when dave was first posting it like it, it it's it's big and the part about the expanse that's in there uh that part i think goes hard and i think um i mean it's tied into so many other conversations that are going on um there's critical media theory going on there's like I don't know, political economy or, or something with like this, like limits, material limits that Evan, well, Evan Wellington is on about, um, there's kind of like theorizing the underground and like developing a milieu. And is it a scene? Is it a milieu? Is it something else? Is it in transition? Like, what is it? What are we doing? Um, libidinal economy, like, I, like I, we are these embodied subjects and we can't, forget that. And I, I tend to, I tend to want to forget that, um, and all that. So, so I think it's a, I think it's a great piece. Why, why I'm not a Marxist actually let's, um, let us do this. Oh, 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 leak digital leakage right here. Nemesine, nemes, nemosine in the fate of capital in the digital age by Samuel Logar. Now, mnemosyne, I can't say that word, dude. And I'm I'm decent at saying words. I have a I have a decent lexicon. Um I like to think anyway, and I can say mnemonic. And like the first part of this word, mnemosyne, is the same first part of the word mnemonic because it is like it's the same root and it is talking about like mnemonics, mnemosyne. Um, so I should be able to say it, but I, I think I struggle here. Osini. So Nimo, I can say Nimo, but then the Sini, I think is what trips me up. Or maybe it's just because I want to say mnemonic, but the word is not mnemonic. This word is Nimosini. And so I, I just get tripped up. I think it's, I think that's probably it. Um, The net, uh, the net one twenty three, Daniel and Michelle shout out. Go over there, uh, OG Rose on YouTube. Give them a like. Um, they go hard. Oh, jeez, what are you doing? No, dude. Okay, sorry about that. Um, bum, 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 bum. Man, my shit's all janky. My shit is all janky. Let me open a new tab. Here we go. Okay, we can see that, right? We can see that. Yes. So why I am not a Marxist or beyond old versus new left, why left at all? What about something else entirely? So right now, uh, it is November 4th, I think. I think I'm supposed to go vote today or maybe tomorrow um and i was gonna vote and then i was like i'm not gonna go vote anymore and then matthew stanley um gave me a bitch slap and he basically called me out um so now i now i think i have to go vote dude i had posted a little note on Substack where i was like i'm a privileged bourgeois bitch and i'm not gonna go vote and he was like you know, we're respectable, but also you're being a privileged bitch and, and maybe you, you know, should be less of a bitch. And I, you know, heard, heard, brother, understood. I hear you. So I 
yes, I have to go vote now. But I think it I think that's today or tomorrow. I don't know. I need to figure it out. Um but other than the the current US and and I think UK election season, um there's other cool stuff going on in the world of like politics and political projects. And the thing that I'm excited about is the launch of the Why Left podcast at or with or through or via um or in you know produced by or whatever i don't know theory underground so there's a new theory underground podcast called why left and it's with benjamin studebaker who we know and love and if you don't know him um or if you don't love him it's probably because you don't know him and if you don't know him well you can check him out on substack you can you know get accepted and be able to afford going to cambridge or you can come to theory underground and uh get acquainted with him and his work he's dope um we love him and he is doing a new podcast with dave and he was the co-founder of the of the what's left podcast um and yeah the what's left podcast was popular was influential and it also kind of um had like a disappointing kind of just like fizzle like it just kind of like just kind of died out and just kind of became like a like oh that was actually disappointing um and it was because you know whatever i don't i'm not it doesn't matter why what does matter is that the why left podcast um is kind of taking up this this mission this question um being a burnt out leftist, being a burnout leftoid, being someone who was, you know, passionate, enthusiastic, earnest, um, maybe, maybe deeply involved or maybe not so deeply involved, but for whatever reason committed to the left. Uh, and then, and then realizing for whatever reason you are, no, you, you can't remain committed to the left and, and for whatever reason that is. And, and, you know, Dave, uh, loudly and often will, um, let people know that he is not committed to the left and he used to be a leftist and he's no longer a leftist. Um, and I think I've, I've said it maybe less often, maybe a little less loudly. Um, but it, it remains true for me as well. Like I think there was a huge, uh, such, such a long, such a huge part of my life. I, I just, I was like, yeah, I'm a leftist. Of course I'm a leftist. Um, and you know, for the last few years, last several years, that's not been the case. Um, and I've kind of just been over it. And I was kind of like, I never really got into the whole post left thing. Cause it was, like from my perspective, it just seemed kind of performative, kind of edgy. Um, and that wasn't what I was looking for. Like I, I really was just kind of over it and I wasn't looking, um, for a place to just kind of sit around and, and dunk on leftoids. Um, I mean, there are, there are a lot of leftoids who just sit around and dunk on normal people. And that's gross. Like, well, I, I, I mean, I don't need to name, I, I don't need to name anybody. Um, if you're aware of leftist streamers, if you're aware of leftist content creators, uh, I'm sure you're well aware of the fact that it's very popular to just kind of dunk on chuds and like dunk on normal people, normal working people, normal family people, like just normal everyday people, um, kind of ridicule and sensationalize and make fun of them. And I think that's gross. Now, is it, is it better when they do it with like public figures, like, you know, guys like Tim pool and guys like Milo and guys like, you know, Fuentes and, and like all these public figures, I mean, it's better, but you know, the only reason it's better is it's because these people are public figures and they've put themselves out there. So it's not like you have to like search and find uh regular everyday people to make fun of you know you just grab public figures to make fun of so it's i mean it's maybe a little bit better if you want to do like this ethical analysis like 
interpersonal ethics and be like, well, sure, it's better, but is it better? Is it really doing anything? I don't think so. I think that's just the same reactionary bullshit. Um, so we have like sides and we have like the left and the right and they're all just kind of slinging shit at each other. And that's always been gross. I've never been into that. Uh, so and it, to me, it felt like that was largely all that was going on with the post left. And I know there was more. There's always more. But uh, yeah, it just, I, I was never really into it. Um, and that's not what's going on here with, with the Y Left podcast. It's, it's not going to be a place where Dave and Benjamin just make fun of the blue haired radicals. Uh, cause first of all, Benjamin still does, Benjamin still will loudly and often, you know, say that he is committed to the left. And so Dave is like, well, I'm not so much. And Benjamin is like, well, I am. And I believe they're going to have some pretty productive conversations about it. And it's exciting. It's exciting for me because I do care and it does matter to me. And I, I understand like this rejection or whatever. Um, it's also like partly protective. It's also because I am still invested in it and it hurts me to kind of see, uh, I guess what everything has become. Um, and I don't want, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Um, so Dave and Benjamin are, are going to, uh, put on their muck raking boots and, uh, and play in that, in that world. Um, and it's exciting. And, uh, this piece, um, why I am not a Marxist or beyond old versus new left, why left at all? What about something else entirely? This piece deals with that, deals with the question, deals with the kind of realization um, of no longer being a leftist, talks about, you know, why, gives some reasons why. It's for Dave. He, he came to understand that it was, it was just silly for him to maintain these commitments. Um, so it's a good piece. The last hour or so of yesterday's live stream on this YouTube channel, uh, 3 billion Nances was Cesar kind of taking us through his relationship to politics and labels and, you know, this, this project in the world of theory, um, and all that stuff. And I'm, you know, I, I don't want to speak for Cesar, so I'll let him speak for himself. Uh, I'm going to clip the part of that stream that was about it, and I'm going to put this little intro on with that video, and I'm going to post it as a standalone video because I think, I don't know, there's something there. Like, I, I think Dave, I think this piece um, is important, but I also think, like, what emerged or what emerges from these conversations, but what emerged concretely from the conversation yesterday, I think it belongs in that conversation too. Um, Cesar asked me, I guess, what my position is. Um, and I kind of gave a non-answer. And I think I often give non-answers. Because um, that's probably the easiest thing to do is to just always give non-answers. Um, but yeah, I don't know. You guys can check it out. Um, give it a watch. Give it a listen. But anyway, uh, I kind of figured we could read through this piece, re read through Dave's piece. Um, and and then I'll, I'll throw Cesar's video up on here and then we'll uh and then we'll throw this up on youtube and and share it because uh yeah i think all this i, th I think all this is a worthy conversation um and it's dope so i'm gonna take a drink and then i'm gonna just read this November 3rd, 2024. 
theory underground dave mccarrick it doesn't say that I, i'm just i don't know it's just kind of weird like how do you start reading uh a piece I, like do you read the title i think i've read the title two or three times at this point i don't know it's weird it was also weird the other day when i was reading uh, one of chris catrone's pieces it was weird it was just like well do i introduce it do i just start reading or what because like it's me i'm speaking it's my voice but they, these are not my words so i have to do something to let you know that i am no longer the one speaking i mean i am actually speaking in form but the you know the words are not my own these are all dave's words <laughs> there we go Driving from the Applewood Orchard, where I had been cutting dead trees all day in 2022, I said, I could at this point probably write up seven pages that bring together all the reasons why I'm not a Marxist. Mikey said, then hang up, pull over, and write it now. So I did. On the side of the highway with my hazard lights flashing, I speedily wrote this out. That's how most of my writing comes out. Because someone asks me a specific question or makes some kind of request that relates to something I've been overthinking. The magical moment gets unlocked by the concrete other's request aligning with my own labor, with all the pregnancy connotations that work can carry. What follows is something I cannot work through properly. It is rough. It is raw. It is true. Hell, it might even be good. But it's not everything. My recent work on the post-class fractured mass takes certain aspects of this and provides a much more sturdy basis with more of the context and stakes. All of the work at Theory Underground goes further in various ways. I've had a kind of writer's block about this piece because I wanted to polish it, but I can't find the time or energy to do so. If I had an editor, it would be different. But go read the Theory Underground publisher statement if you've forgotten that most of what you will see here is in its first draft mode. Go read the writer's block in the fuck it button. Suffice to say, I know there are kinds of Marxism that could recognize what I'm pointing out here. I know there are Marxists who are big-brained enough to contend with these changes. The axe I have to grind is with those Marxists with whom I have organized in the past. Even then, I respect and appreciate their principal take on the world. I just think it's missing the point. What follows are my reasons why I am unconvinced that the old or new left has the correct diagnosis of our situation, much less a plausible or preferable way forward. High modernism. High modernism is wrong, pseudoscientific, and worst of all for Marxists, utopian. What is high modernism? The belief that all problems can be rationally solved by formalistic procedures, top-down administration that works in one place and therefore should work everywhere else, where one person or group can dictate what ought to be done and, because they are the most scientific, these, those proposals will work everywhere. James C. Scott shows how this comes from a specific time of scientific optimism, bolstered by the tremendous gains and astonishing horror ignited by the march of industrialization. What high modernism runs up against are the limits of formalistic knowledge, science, and planning. What works in one country does not in another. The corn that grows best in Massachusetts does not grow well in Idaho. The shit that can be grown everywhere is less tasty and is literally empty of nutritional content. In other words, dead calories. Though this is common knowledge for ecologists today, it was not something the likes of Lenin, Ford, or Le Cabousier could fathom. All they saw were the successes of high modernism immortalized in the cathedrals of labor known as factories. The Soviet attempt to clear-cut forests and then grow only the kinds of wood they immediately needed was just one example of this failure to understand the base complexity in nature. Of the seemingly useless flora and fauna that sustain growth while evading direct empirical function. Though post-colonial thinkers have in many ways taken this analogy too far with their neo-reactionary conception of organic cultural structures that have their own sense of time and language habitation, they nevertheless see and acknowledge something lost on Marxists who, like Christian Yankee evangelicals, would prefer a world where everyone speak the same language, and preferably one without metaphor, 
poetry, or much cultural particularity outside of their own. The same high modernists who saw difference as something to be overcome saw nature as disorderly. Nature pr proved this wrong, and it resulted in tremendous hardship for the Soviet Union, just as it did Ma Mao's China. Likewise, humans prove to not be programmable machines who simply need the correct inputs to make the world revolution. Difference and infinity get overblown by Derrida and Levinas, but they are counteracting the opposite which is a mode of theorizing that was stupid and destined to fail because it was simplistic, pseudoscientific, and utopian. We're in a new timeline. We do not live in the world of Charles Dickens. The working class is as fractured as modern slums, which is very different from how they did things in old cities that had ghettos. Modern slums are subdivided dispersed and hidden away so that those who live in these ghetto shards are not interred in mass. I mean the mobile home parks hiding behind random industrial buildings and department stores across the newer cities. Developers learned a long time ago to not put all the poor people in one place. The proletariat is likewise dispersed across the globe, and the internet does not actually raise the possibility of us seeing one another and feeling our power. See what I did with this idea in this video. The post-class fractured mass, PCFM, uh, it's a good video. Go watch it on YouTube, Theory Underground. Cyber history. Radical anarchist programmers saw a tremendous potential in the internet. The construction of open source software, for instance, tends to lose sight of the way they are. these are presupposed and co-opted by companies who rely on this free labor. More importantly, the internet is irredeemably anti-communist. The handful of Looney Tune online influencers who keep saying they represent the interests of the workers while acting like nothing has fundamentally changed in the last hundred years only prove the point for everyone else who knows in their gut that these people are out of touch. But this is still only the tip of the iceberg. Insofar as there is a working class that could gain mass, it is fundamentally incapable of coming to self-consciousness and organizing in any previously tried ways because of the following factors. Functional illiteracy. Nobody reads anything but advertisements and entertainment, or if nonfiction, then usually as a literalist who is paying attention to a specific ideological line seriously for the first time ever. Retroactive insertion. I recently republished my classic piece on functional illiteracy, which you can read here. And that's a Substack link. And uh, we also did a podcast episode about it the other day. With functional illiteracy, reading takes the form of memorization to bolster a presupposed view, in other words, as apologetics, not for understanding critically from a variety of perspectives that fundamentally call into question the frame, subjects, and contexts of the text in question. This is a problem for everyone because of time energy stultification, as well as the next thing, the education system. That's right. Our education system was constructed not to empower, but to divide, subdue, and co-opt revolutionary potential in a kind of class society that had to be constructed through a regime of public education that was inconceivable in Marx's time, though the seeds had been planted by German idealists like Schelling. Whereas the early conception was one that would make people more legible to the state, easier to predict and therefore preempt or control, the U.S.'s adaptation of that Prussian model was done in light of socialist organizing, with the express purpose to create two classes of people. As Woodrow Wilson put it in 1910, in direct response to labor organizing, we want one class of persons to have a liberal, read, read liberating, education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class, of necessity in every society to forego the privileges of a liberal, read liberating, education, and fit themselves to perform specific, difficult, manual tasks. Retroactive insertion. I did not cite anything here because this is a quick note, but I think you can find most of this in Weapons of Mass Instruction by John Taylor Gatto. That book goes hard, by the way. 
This first class is made up of accomplished, competent, and even sometimes intelligent tryhards who reify meritocracy and presuppose this division of labor in everything they say and do, no matter how much they might purport to want the abolition of class. Whether right or left, the PMC is self-assured that they have earned their place and that it is simply the other side's fault that more genuinely deserving, like-minded people are not in their department, bureau, or C-suite. Consumerism. Capitalism adapted in ways unforeseen to Marx by producing an endless variety of new addictions than could have ever been imagined. Though, of course, I do believe that McGowan's Zizekian critical understanding of how this works combined with time energy as a master signifier deals a blow to this, but that is necessarily not something that will come with a rushed revolution anytime soon because, one, revolutionaries seem the least capable of understanding the necessity of time energy or the problems that it counters, two, rushed revolutions undermine the conditions for socialism, and three, it takes time for a concept to become viral in a way that detonates a regime of commodity fetishism. Subjectivity is complicated. Part of consumerism, but deserving its own place in this list because it was a problem independent of consumerism, Marxists had no theory of subjectivization, social reproduction, desire, or ideology beyond the homo economicus who is under false consciousness. These, as well as what gets called postmodern critique of representation, are all developed by post-Marxist French theorists, often called post-structuralists, or postmodern. Every single one of these theorists has their own theory of how Marxism failed to adequately conceptualize, formulate, or work through each of these lacunae. I am putting all of these onto one point where, in, in reality, each theorist who develops a theory or critique on the basis of these issues, or their correlates, is a force to be reckoned with who sees things that must be taken into account for any revamped project that aims at genuinely plausible social engineering. These so-called postmodernists are not trying to foil Western society, as Peterson and Hicks think, but are merely diagnosing the changed conditions that the old left failed to acknowledge theorize, or address, which resulted in the general incredulity toward meta-narratives. This takes us to the next point. The post-trust era. Distrust. We live in a post-trust society where the only people who believe ideologies or institutions wholeheartedly are dupes, literalists, fundamentalists, unhinged weirdos, or wannabe heroes stuck in the past, desperately clinging to a worldview that will explain everything. cynical ideology factors in here. Moreover, simply the fact that no amount of lesser evil contrivance makes any side less the liars, the media more believable, or will cause the overwhelming masses to feel less gaslit by the it's-just-too-simple crowd. This relates to the next one outside of this subcategory of factors that irredeemably fracture the working class. The Medium McLuhan is correct that modern media developments invert the base superstructure relation in a way lost on traditional Marxists. Baudrillard saw the writing on the wall, but everyone else is acting like they didn't get the memo. Perhaps it's buried in their 10,000 unread emails. Probably, considering the fact that the age of information oversaturization, TMI, necessitates tactics that subjectivize us in ways that make mass unification on or around much not only impossible, but really only impossible for anything that seeks to counter or replace capitalism by way of unification on the basis of an understanding of complexity. Marxists practically invented propaganda, but they never mastered it. Insofar as great aesthetics and shutting down the press of your enemies goes, fascists perfected that model. However, both communists and fascists lost the propaganda war because repression coupled with calls for loyalty and othering only get you so far for as long as the workers are beginning to realize. The true winners of that game were advertising and capitalist, democratic, duopoly media, which both learned a long time ago that reasoning with audiences matters less than populating the horizon of possibilities and references with false choices. 
Make everyone have to choose an identitarian stand vis-a-vis -vis your logo, and it doesn't matter if they subscribe. What matters is that insofar as X number will not, the next one will. It is simply a numbers game where consent is not the only thing manufactured, but desire, identity, and result amount too. This works for churches and commodities, for ideological spin-off groups who pose themselves as cult-like solutions to the mainstream, but this does not work to unify despite difference, especially not for the working class who, who is, like everyone else now, born-again consumers. The internet is not what it seems. The internet exists and is irredeemably anti-communist. Too often, the internet is proposed as some kind of fantastic new opportunity that would have worked in favor of the workers of the old. Had they only this communication architecture, they would have succeeded. Now, we can truly be the international working class. Except it was invented by anti-communist cyberneticians. In other words, security state think tanks applying the new science of control, cybernetics, in a way only dreamed of by Machiavelli or Schelling. Big data, rendering the population legible, and machine learning are not just about elaborate lists of people and ways of keeping a step ahead of their revolutionary potential. It is not just about spying or psyop, psyopsing. It is also about the construction of desires and identities, or subjectivization. The deep state is not a nation. The deep state serves anti-communism more than it serves some bullshit like democracy or America. As such, it is more attached to a reactionary version of global capital than it is to any nation, and it definitely does not serve the U.S. government. The U.S. government serves corporations, but is ultimately answerable to the CIA. No such apparatus existed in Marx's time, nor in Lenin's. Lenin walked into the Winter Palace. Like the January 6th guys, except when they got in there, they had the levers of the state. The thing those January 6th guys will never understand is that the levers of the state are not in the capital, and the FBI used them to expand its controls. In fact, every seemingly radical act that simulates previous revolutionary movements proves nothing more than a media event to reify the duopoly's interdependent identitarian reliance on the one hand and on the other to give the security state opportunities to expand control, practice its response tactics, and more importantly, keep the radical left and right operating under this assumption that these spectacular occasions amount to something more than sacrifice and baptism for some true believers and weirdos to solidify the silent majority in its post-trust cynicism. The old left is beyond redemption. Not only was Marx and co. able to presuppose an already partially self-aware and concentrated proletariat that was involved in various forms of labor struggle that we today lack, all the preceding points not only factor into the liquidation of that working class power, but the old left's failure to contend with these changes combined with the long-term failures brought on by bold sacrifices for short-term gains have resulted in the old left appearing worse than what it seeks to replace. Retroactive insertion despite what Daniel Tutts and Gabriel Rockhills will tell you. To some degree, this is the result of Cold War propaganda. To some degree, this is on those remaining veterans either selling out or failing to take responsibility for those failures. But in any case... What remains is a hyper-fractured, intra-class, divided, identitarian, consumer, silent majority only unified by its distrust of institutions, ideologues, and purported representatives. Those are not the conditions for Democrats or their rebellious college students to win more than an election, much less for a real fundamental transformation of society that abolishes the commodity form of labor and, more importantly, replaces it with something better than forced labor. Because the last serious revolution demanded forced labor and generations of sacrifice from the blood, sweat, and toil of the overwhelming masses in those revolutionary societies, and because those sacrifices were preyed upon by layers of cynical bureaucracy who purported to represent their interests, 
You're just going to need to work harder and sacrifice for generations so that your children's children's generation can enjoy socialism is just not a convincing proposition. Not only because the priesthood, religious or secular, ancient or modern, has throughout history been more or less fine with any configuration of society so long as it can play the role of ideological purveyors, representatives, shepherds, guides, or influencers. That alone is enough to raise a valid populist eyebrow at any movement that purports to lead this regime of light labor meant to outcompete capitalism, whether from behind or in front, from top down or from below, either democratically or in an authoritarian manner, these options are all unconvincing when the confident wannabe leaders and bureaucrats will be at least as fine and comfortable in that society as they are in this one. When the sacrifices being demanded are of labor, while those who do the demanding stand to gain power and prestige for themselves and their families. Even if they could secure for the working class fair pay, technical ownership of the means of production, increased say and stake, shorter working days, and a larger, longer weekend, it seems implausible that the PMC is ever going to see, much less feel, the problem of time energy the way it is viscerally understood by laboring people everywhere. Retroactive insertion. That's why we also need a theory of energy time, which was presented briefly and recently here at a philosophy portal conference. Thanks, Cadell Last. And that's a link to Cadell Last on Substack and also YouTube. Go check out Cadell Last on Substack. Go check out Philosophy Portal on YouTube. Check it out. It's dope. Even if the PMC could represent the interests of the working class, it seems impossible that the PMC could genuinely center time energy as the public good that needs to be actualized. Part of the reason, beyond failing to understand it at the visceral level, is that the sheer will to abolish bullshit jobs and redistribute shitty work that cannot be automated out of existence will only come from those who lack time energy, prestige, and the power to have relative power over labor and capital flows. Even the handful of PMC individuals who see the importance of the abolition of value still talk about 40-year plans, while Amazon warehouses, drones, self-driving cars, and increasing production is either already automated or within reach of automation, if only the political will was there. But it will never be there with these guys. Marx did not see his name get used as the justification for a regime of forced labor and indefinite terror. If he did, this idea of indefinite deferral of the abolition of class and the labor form specific to capital by PMC, whether democratic or not, would not be a proposition to accept uncritically. Retroactive insertion. Not only do I question what I wrote above, I actually think I might have it backwards, but that's for another time. The Expanse. What I'll call The Expanse is not something that anyone seems to have seriously registered. Infinite growth on a finite planet is not possible, is something said by people who are all for practical purposes, who are for all practical purposes living in a previous century. They might as well be geocentric. Their ideology and perspective is incapable of registering the fact that we have already landed on the moon, Mars, and asteroids. Mining missions are already in motion. These people think we will run out of oil before we find new forms of energy to harness for space travel. Retroactive insertion. Shout out to Evan, James, and Shad Hag as names that come to mind. They do not understand that capitalism could keep doing its thing for another million years. Socialism might have its place on some spaceships or earthly communes, but those will be among a plurality of other existing social experiments going on like the space Mormons in the TV show, The Expanse, or the earthly Amish in our current reality. Considering the fact that all of these problems are new conditions were either not present for Marx or else remained in their germ state at his time, we are, in our historicity, responsible for reassessing the situation. Back to the drawing board. When engineers keep failing to construct something, they go back to the relevant physics and math, when social engineers fail to organize society, radical theory must be renewed through critical history and philosophy that takes into account the failures and changed conditions from a plurality of perspectives. It is otherwise quite obviously doomed to failure and farce. The old left did not simply fail because it tried too early, because of outside sabotage, or due to bad personalities or motives of corrupted insiders. 
those all had their place in its downfall, and obviously any repeated attempt to do as Lenin or some other revolutionary did would have to show how the conditions are more ripe, how the plausibility is more sound than before, and this would have to be articulated by people capable of taking to heart above listed changes, the above listed changes. To take to heart does not mean simply deflate, dismiss, or attempt to debunk each point in isolation from one another. It means taking the PCFM pill and sitting with it, allowing oneself to let go of immediate application and objectives, to see the world through the eyes of those who had, come to, who had to come to terms with it, or first articulate the changes and problems unseen or left out of prior theory. It means doing a period of moratorium on revolutionary, revolutionary and personality politics. It means take our specific historical situatedness seriously. Take failure seriously. Don't brush it off and act like we could just jump back up and keep going. The idea that we don't have time to think is a marketing ploy by people who think we're too stupid to realize the universe is basically infinite in scope and resources. The insistence that we act now is the motto of arrested development. But maturity understands that if we do not have time, then we certainly do not have time to act like we do not have time. Considering the above listed facts of our unique historical situatedness, Marx's purported solution, or the dictatorship of the proletariat, which he never rigorously theorized, is clearly one that must be suspended and critically worked through. Obviously, if the situation changes, then the solution might prove no longer plausible, preferable, or wise. If the proletariat is not a concentrated mass, then what is meant by this term? Is the dictatorship simply of or also by the proletariat? To say it is by the proletariat ushers in working class identity politics as the working class people have some angelic consciousness due to social position, social standpoint. That necessarily means they know what's best. It should not take much to disenchant your average Marxist of this notion, considering the fact that identity politics and standpoint epistemology are obviously not the solution. So what then? A dictatorship that purports to represent the interests of the proletariat? That brings in all the problems of representation in a post-trust society where generalized skepticism is a valid response to the fact that anything can be simulated, including sincerity, authenticity, recognition, and interests. If the situation is different and the solution proves complicated in ways that must be addressed, there is then the fact that the goal itself, irrespective of the means, has itself not been adequately thought through. In other words, freedom has been ill-conceived by past iterations. The concept of time energy is, I would argue, essential to fleshing out a substantial theory of freedom. Left versus right are ill-conceived reifications of bourgeois society. Psychological gerrymandering. No theory has dialectically sublated the most essential moments in all previous movements or worldviews that follow from the bourgeois revolution. Liberalism was correct in its core assertions, though many of those proved contradictory in the ways the old left would articulate. Conservatism was correct in its base assumption that institutions take time to prove themselves, that rituals and beliefs might serve purposes not fully known to their practitioners, and that hasty, bloody change undermines the harmonious conditions taken for granted, yet desired in more abundance, by revolutionaries. Conservatives would be fine if they did as the Amish do, but they err in trying to do some radical society-wide revolt against modernity. The old left was correct about the true basis of cultural oppression, the value form of labor, but its solutions were all insufficient to the task of addressing those base causes, much less the identitarian feuds created by those causes that live on irreducible, that live on irreducible to their origin and production, resulting in societies nobody would choose to live in. The new left was right to focus its energies on more immediately pressing and long-neglected struggles, but wrong in its failure to seriously reconstruct a critique of capital that maintains the babies from those previous ideologies and movements, just as it was wrong to throw out all the conservative values as essentially reactionary, when only the specific modes and articulations as currently formulated by existing conservative institutions are problematic, 
not the values or base assumptions themselves. All of the above failed to take the DOS Capital project as seriously as our situation demands. The only people who took that project seriously were dogmatic Marxists, either of the traditional, orthodox, or Althusserian veins, but in all of these cases, they failed to, recon they failed to consider either Marx's method, Grossman, Matic, Heinrich, his focus on the abolition of the form of labor itself, Pastone, the fact that his project was a critique of political economy, not a political economy or a history, Pastone, Grossman, Matic, Heinrich, and most importantly, they all, including their disciples today, fail to seriously consider the fact that capital could exist for another thousand years. A million years. And it could do so without capitalists. The universe is big, but they act like evangelicals who think the earth is young, or idealists who think fossils are a mental construct. Marxists and socialists alike fail to seriously consider the expanse or the related concept of deep time. Marxists, from Engels to Stalin, believed in an evolution of leaps and bounds, which has now been thoroughly debunked. They failed to realize that change also happens slow enough to occur right before our very eyes, yet just slow enough to go missed by the inattentive, distracted, untrained, or purely action-oriented eye. If, beyond the old versus new left, there is to be instead a next left, it is going to have a longer game in mind and the expanse is in its sights, but it will not force everyone to go. Those who seek to remain on earth and be Amish or back to earth types will get to. The women and children of both sides will have safe havens to escape to if they are oppressed in their little cultural experiments. The work for progressives who wish to remain on earth will be to try to maintain peace between various traditionalist and secular natural experiments while tending to the construction and development of safe havens for the runaways. Any leftist who is against this formula doesn't care to get off this planet is libidinally addicted to scapegoating a straw man of the regressive other and has no positive project that does not require a thousand years of civil to world war that annihilates the only good possibilities inherent to capital while simultaneously strengthening its most scary reactionary and evil versions. The question I want to end on is this. Must there be a next left? Could there be something else that does not necessarily include an excluded placeholder to scapegoat? Might the only way to make sure something human makes it into the near future be an approach that is inclusive of left and right tendencies while simultaneously cutting off those influences that would have us be mutually exclusive? Maybe we need to move beyond left versus right when it comes to larger scale projects. Leave those to town hall meetings and inter-county disputes. Any great nation, much less empire, will have to represent more or less everyone, or at least function in such a way as to give its citizens that sense. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, bum. And then and there's a little author bio here. Um, author bio, David McCarricker is a ninja, and he can do seven backflips. And that's the end. Ooh, yay! Yay! Hooray! Wee! Yeah! Good job. Anyway, that was Dave's piece. Why I'm not a Marxist. It's a good piece. Um, and and yeah, it's. I mean, these are all interesting questions. They're all important questions. We've been having this conversation for a while. We've been having the conversation at Theory Underground for a while. I think uh, many of us have been having the conversation outside of theory underground as well but it's it's a it's a very important question for theory underground um and it and it's it's kind of a part of all the things that we are doing but i wanted to so first of all i didn't i didn't necessarily plan to read the whole thing uh and maybe i maybe i won't put the whole thing in this video i probably will let's be real i probably will um the other day someone left a comment like telling me i talk too much uh i mean yeah i agree dude 
I talk too much. The stuff I make is over, over long and it's kind of meandering and wandering and it lacks focus and direction. Um, I mean, part of that is because like, I'm, uh, I'm also getting something out of this, this, like I, I am trying to communicate. There are like, so I am speaking into a void. I'm speaking into a camera and a microphone. There's like, I'm getting no response right now. I'm speaking into a void. But there is a virtual other in that void, and it's that potential that's kind of changing um, what I'm doing. So it's not like I'm just talking. I mean, I kind of am just talking to hear myself talk. Um, but I also am kind of talking to this virtual other. Um, even though I may not be necessarily anticipating a response, while I would appreciate a response, like it's not it's not like the anticipated response that I'm working with. It's it's the it's the anticipated reception that I'm working with. So I'm trying to like I'm trying trying to speak in a way so that at least one person will hear me. Blah, blah, blah. Jesus Christ, this is getting sappy. So yeah, uh, if you if you think I'm overlong and uh, overly meandering and all that, like, okay, cool. I, I think I agree. You're right. Um, but also, fuck you. <laughs> um, but so the reason I wanted to do this, because I like this piece. Uh, it's dope that, that he reposted it. Um, here's a reading of it. If, if you don't have the time to read it, or if you, if you're not on Substack but you're on my YouTube for whatever reason, um, there you go. Go to Substack, subscribe to Dave, Theory Underground. Um, give him some love and attention. But I also think, like, the conversation that happened yesterday with Cesar when we were talking about anarchism, that I'm jokingly titling why I'm still an anarchist. Like, I, I think I think that um, some part of me is also responding to Dave in this. So Dave is kind of breaking it down, sexual style, for all these people, like, why I am not a Marxist. And I'm like, yeah, man, Dave, you, you can speak for me in this case. I mean, in, in many cases, Dave can speak for me. Like, because it is just the case that like, yeah, you said it. I would, I would say it differently. You know, I would go about saying it in a different way. Um, but yeah, dude, spot on. Um, but this little conversation, whatever, why I'm still an anarchist. Um, I, th I think it, I think it belongs, you know, right beside this um and i think i'm speaking to directly like what came out of me in in that conversation and it was just actually like a five or ten minute part where i actually kind of uh ponder and wonder uh about well i shit at the end of the day i guess i am still some kind of anarchist at the end of the day i really do think i am a, a posadist Shout out Benjamin Studebaker that came up recently. And and yeah, I think I am. Um, but I also, I wouldn't call myself that. Um, like if, if someone were to ask me, which I don't think someone would ask me, are you a leftist? I don't know. I just, that's not the conversations I have. So it is like, I'm kind of like uh, talking to a fake made up person, uh, which is what I'm doing right now also. Um, but yeah, I no, I, I I think, um, I think it, yeah, I I guess I am still some kind of anarchist. Uh, well, and even some somewhere in the, I don't know the podcast description, uh, my podcast description on Substack, it says something like I'm I'm some kind of like state realist anarchist post Marxist, uh, nihilist utopian, um. And I, yeah, like I I don't know how to explain it. I don't think it matters so much the the label explaining it because I, like the reason for selecting the label is what's really important and so if i can spend more time um on the content less time on the form i'm all for it it is what it is um but yeah there you go there you have it so that's the reading of why i am not a marxist i'm gonna go ahead and and add uh the clip from the Cesar conversation of why I'm still an anarchist.
Um, and yeah, if you think I talk too much and I'm over long, I agree with you, dude. You're right. Um, but it's what I do. And actually, like very recently, I've uh, been I've been in like a really weird mood, and um, I know what I know what it is. Um, I know what's on my mind. Like, so the other day I said, I was talking about like when you have something on your mind and you just can't stop thinking about it, like, and like a concept or a notion. And it's like when a song gets stuck in your head and it just keeps going, keeps going and keeps going and it can even become torturous. But when it's concepts, when it's notions, when it's questions, I actually think it's a good thing. And I think that's what drives me to write. And that's what drives me to like try to have these conversations with people and try to read and like understand what other people are saying so that I can help flesh out these ideas at my own head. Um, so it's good. Like I, I am, I am happy to like obsess on these ideas, concepts, questions. That's all great. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like recently it's been like, it's not been, I mean, it has been like concepts and, and questions and notions and stuff, but it's also been like a, a sp specific person. And that's a weird thing. Like if you've ever, like you can't stop thinking about a person. Um, that's weird. Um, and so that's bothering me. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, yeah, it'll it, it's fine. I'll repress it. I'm a big boy. I've spent the last like, well, that oh no, that's actually what it is. That's actually what's bothering me because I've spent the last like 11 years. Um, what year is it? Yeah, right about 11 years, like just repressing, um, whatever part of me that is like uh, embodied, right, and like you know, the part of me that like loves or whatever, or whatever. Um, cause I had to turn that part of me off because you know, the way things happened in my life, uh, it, it just became a thing I had to do. Uh, uh I had to, it, I had to do it so I could, you know, uh, be a functioning, uh, member of society being a, be a function, functioning member of a family, a functioning, a, a productive member of the world. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, but recently, um, things have changed and I've, I've found myself, um, I, I think I'm almost unwilling to, to do that. I think I'm almost not, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to stuff that guy down anymore. I don't want to, uh, refuse that guy. I want to let that guy sing um and dance because i think that i think that's important too and and so daniel garner and only michelle garner with like all the a lot of the work they do and benjamin studebaker as well talking about love and Anne, talking about nurture and like i don't know like it's just a thing that i know i don't i i don't i don't do it it's just easier for me just to not do it um but uh you know, recently I've, I've, uh, I've been confronted with that guy trying to, uh, trying to re, uh, resurface. Um, and I'm at this point right now where I'm like, well, how do I handle this? Like, do I let that guy, uh, do I let that guy come out and do a big song and dance number, you know? Um, or do I punch him and tell him to shut the fuck up and go, go back to his little, bitch quarter and i think the healthy thing to do is no let him you know let him come out and play and sing uh and then once he's done his big musical number give him a round of applause and and then he can come back and and you know i'll be better for having done so so i guess um that's why i'm uh more uh i guess uh um, bummed out or emotional or whatever it is for, you know, recently. Um, and I think I'm unwilling to, to just repress it. Like, I, th I think I need to let that guy, uh, free, but 
shut up, dude. Like now I am talking too much. So I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to take the video from yesterday. I'm going to put these two together. I'm going to shoot it out into cyberspace and it'll be on YouTube here pretty soon. And then later on today, which it doesn't make sense to talk about today and this evening and this morning on the internet in a YouTube video. Um, cause like this is just going to be up there and, and you might be watching this. If anyone is, it probably is far into the future. And, and this afternoon is, is long gone. Um, but from my perspective, I will be back in several hours with a special guest um, doing a little stream and uh, and it'll be all good. So enjoy the upcoming conversation with Cesar. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your morning, afternoon, evening. Enjoy your life. I'll see you all some other time. Uh, but yeah, dude, the... Uh, it's crazy, but uh, fuck metalheads, fuck Slipknot, mm -hmm. fuck you, Jacob. Not fuck you, Jacob. You're dope. You're coming on tomorrow. We're gonna, we're gonna have a conversation. It's gonna be sick. Uh, I'm actually gonna go to the restroom. Okay. And then we can transition into talking about some anarchist shit. So if you're mm. if you're a smelly Marxist, you're no longer welcome. We're gonna fucking talk about <laughs> Kropotkin and uh, a, a fucking a stateless society yeah. go fuck yourself no offense to any canadians i mean all the offense dude to speak for yourself <laughs> i am intentionally trying to offend them um <laughs> no i'm not uh, canada's cool um never been there want to go i'm gonna go pee yeah you can riff if you want um yeah i'm gonna start a little bit of uh lead you all through yeah. a little bit of Cesar's intellectual uh, uh, choose your own adventure. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'll start off by saying um, I come from, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll wait till Nance gets back for that one, which let's see. Maybe we'll start. I have this book. Uh, don't know if that will focus. Yeah, it might not focus. But this book's called Desert. Um, it's a book written by an anonymous anarchist for anarchists. And um, it essentially talks about what an anarchist a approach to um, the coming climate uh, changes that'll happen in places around the world. So this kind of ties in a lot of things of how I got, how I've led into this, um, my philosophical standpoint, uh, p perhaps I guess like a political standpoint as well right now of things related to climate, um, anarchist, anarchism. Sure. Yeah. Um, also about being remaining open to context and complexity of the world. So how did I kind of get there? Well, uh, I first started, here's, here's a book example of, uh, Thomas Merton. Damn, these are not gonna, okay, that's good enough. But um, yeah, Thomas Merton, he uh, was a priest, or he, he was at least a monk, um, like, throughout the 20th century. Um, a lot of people, like, referencing him, even people who are uh, not really into Christianity either. Um, uh, but all of this to say is that I have a Catholic background. That's, like, where my family comes from, and... I think that's like some of the first theoretical rigor that I can remember. Theory and pr and praxis, maybe that's a way we could say it. But it's a thing where it's not necessarily a political praxis. It's more of a here's a theory of almost like metaphysics, of ethics, of phenomenology, and here's the praxis for getting to those things. Um, uh, so 
yeah, I just kind of bring up this book, not because it's like a touchstone for me, but just to say that's kind of like my first background with um, being a thinking person. So then I, uh, I mean, another big thing was that my mother took me to the library as a kid. And, um, and also like one of my favorite activities growing up was um, going to the Borders bookstore all the way on the, you know, expensive side of town. Um, we'd go there almost like once a week or once every two weeks. Um, and it was a great place for me to like learn a lot about music. So I was like getting into um, just learning about music, kind of starting from like punk music as like my chosen uh um identity of how i was identifying with music for the first time um but really it was from there i got to see like the references that um all the interesting punk bands would have um and then of course punk music has a politics that uh it um associates with uh very explicitly so i think i was also getting ideas of like history from that uh political standpoints uh, maybe a little bit of philosophy can't i don't know can't really think of too much of that um all that to say going to borders getting like a new cd um and also getting like new books and like being a, a reader um, so then went to university here in, um, in Phoenix, well, technically Tempe. Um, and, uh, I went into the realm of like a new program called sustainability, um, regarding like environmental sustainability. For whatever reason, you had to have like, um, a high amount of mathematics prerequisites and uh <laughs> i could for i don't know i couldn't pass the the pre-calculus class for whatever reason so didn't end up doing that but went into biology instead with the focus on um what was it called it was called biology and society so it allowed you to do humanities classes related to science like philosophy, history, and ethics. So those were some really great classes to be involved in. I also really enjoyed my Religion 101 class, which is like, you don't always get that with just like the basic, the basic level like uh, course that you get at university as being like an important one. But I was just like, whoa, I'm I'm enjoying diving into this. It's like it's almost like sci-fi <laughs> in a way. Like you get to kind of just nerd out on like this new universe and like, oh, here this is what the characters are. Um, this is like how they interact with each other. Um But all of that to say whoa. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. It's alright, it's, uh, it's all shit that I should have done something with. <laughs> um, yeah, I... The, the question of, like, climate change and environments and uh, energy limits, that stuff has kind of just always been around, especially growing up in a desert. You don't um, want to lose... The natural beauty of the world. <laughs> climate change, this shit's going bye-bye. Well, that stuff will stay around. Well, that, yeah, that'll But, stay like, around. the water that you don't see... That'll go away. Yeah. <laughs> what else will go away? That? Oh, yeah. Less... Lower levels of that. Yeah. Climate change sucks. <laughs> but, well... That's a... That's something I want to kind of bring up is that uh, there was lots of different perspectives people had when I was at university regarding um, what the approach should be for how to address climate change. So you have maybe, let's say, it's the conservation 
um, approach of we need to like set more boundaries on our natural the natural world that we still have in America specifically um and like I'm gonna show you my fucking <laughs> like a lot of regulation basically a lot of planning um and then there's maybe another school of thought that's like well there's already a lot of invasive species that like have been in places for so long they've become the new native species mm. um mm. what does it mean if we could just uh accept that this is their the new environment mm. and still work with it somehow um and then there's like a few other perspectives and things that i learned throughout that time but um i kind of want to bring that up with like the latest things i've i've uh been into which is uh it's almost kind of like um a bit of science fiction uh well like this this one is definitely more science fiction um we won't get the this is this book's bolo bolo it's actually kind of like a little mixture of like some marxist stuff but like anarchist stuff um but also kind of like uh i don't know it's it's sci-fi in a lot of ways um it's it's basically would you you call it theory fiction i guess so it is it is a little bit like theory fiction um but um that's also paired with something like this this book is called retro suburbia and it's a big ass book actually written by uh it's a permaculture book Uh, permaculture being the idea that you're trying to create your your homestead or your neighborhood um to be uh constantly just living within its its own context of uh sort of like you're doing things that are resilient for your context um and that you could actually pass a future on (laughs) maybe that's kind of the implicitness is that there is a future that you're trying to maintain um but it's interesting it the subtitle of this is the downshifters guide to a resilient future so this book assumes that energy descent is a reality that will happen, which is to say not energy depletion. I think that's so much conversation surrounding energy and climate change um, suggests that it has to necessarily be a catastrophe for everybody all at once. Um, Whereas, like, yeah, this this book, Bolo Bolo, this book, Desert, this book, Retro Suburbia, they're all suggesting that it's not going to happen the same way in every place. Some places actually might even have more opportunities in this future, depending on how resources kind of open up, specifically the global north, Mm -hmm. uh, where it's like pretty cold. Bitch ass Canada. Yep. Mm hmm already looking into how do we get more oil out there you know yep (laughs) um and then you know there and then pretty much the global south equatorial areas uh it's just going to be less desirable i but i think i think people will still be living there the the, you know there's going to be some anarchists who are going to be like yeah dude free like state is gone or whatever like we need to go out there (laughs) and like dude do our own thing i i mean there's shit like slab city yeah Mm -hmm. um that's that is kind of like the ruins of post-war america Mm -hmm. and there are people who moved in we have people that you know squatters like like there there is a type of person who kind of seeks out ruin Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course there will be these people and yeah it briefly came up at the the food place that one night um oh, food hall food hall someone asked us what we what we thought the future of uh 
of Phoenix looks like. And then it, it, it came up again the next night at Dave's house. Mm. Um, and you were like, like someone, like it might have been Elton, like asked you about what you think the future of Arizona looks like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you responded with, and I agree with your response was like it, it's good there there will be like a like a high tech enclave mm. um surrounded by climate refugees by something that approaches like bedouin like mm. i've been to iraq i've seen bedouin i've seen like these migratory peoples who yeah that's their way of life they migrate and, and we're a border state yeah so we already have yeah. migration we, that's already a thing here <laughs> like there already yeah. are people who live so similarly to gypsies or Bedouin mm -hmm. or whatever, and it's and they do it here, and they pick fucking celery, mm -hmm. um, and that shit sucks. I or didn't... they work like uh, under the table, uh, yep, uh, dollar exchange kind yep. of jobs. Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just because like Phoenix is collapsing doesn't mean that there will be no <clears throat> human in the rubble. I think there definitely mm. will be people who live in the rubble, and and Phoenix is just the you know yeah. the example that's you know present at hand we also have like all of mexico <laughs> is probably done i think mexico city will re will persist mm. uh it'll be like badly like fucking hollowed out mm. but there's 25 million people there now a lot yeah <laughs> fucking shit look, mexico city's one of the biggest fucking cities in the world yeah 25 million people um but it's being gentrified to hell and back right now mm. Um, but places like Iraq, places like Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is building the line. Have you seen any yet? Neom? Mm -mm. Some dumb bullshit. You should look it up on YouTube. It's fucking stupid. It's propaganda. But people are excited about it and talking about it like it's real and like it's really going to happen. Like they're like Saudi Arabia is going to build the high tech future utopian city. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're just going to use fucking you mini slaves mm -hmm. to to churn, to generate billions of dollars for some construction magnates. Uh, and nothing's actually going to be built. They're just like, that's what, that, that is like an industry over there. Just like they had the World Cup. Like they had mm. all the fucking, essentially slaves or indentured servants or whatever you want to call it. But they had all these migrant slaves building all this infrastructure. That's why people don't like the Olympics. Because mm. it's, it's like they, they uproot a lot of people, they have a lot of migrant workers and they do so much damage to the community for this like quick turnaround event mm. and then they leave and the infrastructure just rots. And so whatever was there before that new construction was destroyed for the new construction and the new construction get, gets destroyed because they can't afford to maintain it or upkeep it. And so it's just like dropping a shit bomb on a city every time the Olympics comes through mm. and they're going to wind up doing the same thing in Saudi Arabia across the entire fucking Arabian Peninsula with just bullshit construction projects so someone can make a quick billion bucks but nothing's actually going to happen um but the world's ending the world's fucking ending mm, maybe maybe mm. that that's the thing is this book kind of convinced me that some worlds will end Ooh, <laughs> ooh. but it it really is like <laughs> It really is going to be a thing of like, um, <laughs> um, even climate change won't be enough to kill mm -hmm. something like capitalism. Oh, for but sure. It also, it also won't be enough to kill all the humans. For sure. That's the thing is, I maybe I just have a problem with the catastrophe narrative where it has to be a all or nothing. Yep. Whereas I think the world is very complex. And we to hold that complexity um I think is important because then it also means some places in the world might start to have to be isolated again the mm -hmm. way that they were kind of pre-globalization. Yeah. And so then it's like okay, what does that mean? Right. Like, how does that if, if we were to think of like a place like Phoenix, we're going to have different problems than a, a place like Vancouver, Vancouver. Exactly. Right. Um, or even like 
in the middle or of in nowhere San Francisco. Or, or in the yeah, yeah Bozeman, Bozeman Montana. Montana. Exactly, like a smaller place. Yeah. Like, um, and so it's. I think also what this book was showing me is that, um, yeah, be aware that uh, terrible things will take place. Um, mm. but also at least this is being addressed to anarchists of there are opportunities that open up for anarchists to then intervene in places maybe where they hadn't really been able to like give me an example um, that sounds interesting well the more obvious example from this is um, he's talking about like going to places where um you're more like a destroy destroy kind of anarchist smashy smashy yep, yep, yep. kind will have more opportunity to like do that okay <laughs> um to be involved smashy, in smashy smashy, smashy. <laughs> um and uh mm. where it is a little bit more of like gang oriented kind of living like if you wanted to like get Nazis out of your town, you could actually do that. Go get them, and like not have repercussions of like now you're blacklisted and yep. like your face is recognized. But that stuff still might be around like surveillance technology for sure. Um, but there just might be less state presence in places that are just not profitable anymore, and so it allows people who decide to stay there to maybe have a little bit more say in how that place now can live. So, but it's a lot more contention on a on a human level. Yeah. Less contention on a uh, economic or um, state level. So that sounds honestly like a like a, a right wing libertarian mm. of mm -hmm. Wonderland. Like that's like to me that sounds like like, like Curtis Yarvin, Yarvin would love that. Mm. And I don't know if Curtis Yarvin is a right wing libertarian when he's, I don't know what he is, but like, yeah. Um, but no, like that, that smells like American libertarians mm. to me. Mm -hmm. um, or the dumbasses that call themselves ANCAPs, mm. where they're like, well, like, it, you know. Which I, yeah, I, I have like uh, not as much familiarity with like that kind of stance of, Anarchist capitalist, right? Well, it does, it's not. It's not real. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't exist. But it, um, and like because capital relies on the state to legitimate it. So without the state, there would be no capital. So there, like, there's no such thing as like a a, a stateless <laughs> capitalism. Now we can still have systems of exchange and value. Mm -hmm. in an anarchist society, but you you would assume that that would be like mutually agreed upon. And it would be kind of enforced as, like, it, it, in situ enforced. Like, like mm. it would be enforced by the community itself. Like, the community that's subject to the law is also the community that's enforcing the law. Mm -hmm. And so it's more, more anarchist mm -hmm. than, you know, authoritarian or, or whatever. But the, the, the ANCAP position is just silly and it's not real but i understand i understand why people go there because uh there is currently an invisible hand in the markets now currently our invisible hand has a congenital defect where it only wants to lift up certain small numbers of people it doesn't actually adjust the market according to like what's worthy and what's valuable and what's meritorious and what deserves to be lifted up well it's not human oriented correct yeah it's value oriented mm -hmm. um but, but I, I mean i definitely understand why people flock to american libertarianism mm. like i just said it's stupid you guys are stupid retarded idiot dorks or whatever i take it back i don't mean that i understand i empathize with you guys that hold that position i'm here to tell you it, it doesn't work mm. it wouldn't work that way yeah. if there's value if there's merit in an area there will be a structure that exploits that and there will be human communities that spring up around those structures because we still don't have robots. So we still need human labor power. We can problematize human labor power and the labor theory of value. And trust me, I've spent a lot of time doing so. And I am more of a value form guy than a labor theory of value guy. But it is also the case that currently human labor 
is a source of value. And if we can replace the human labor with robot labor, cool. But until we do, there will be structures that crop up where there's value, where there's resources to exchange or resources to convert to create value. There will be structures that pop up. Those structures will use humans. So there will be human communities that pop up and there will be force and there will be conflict and there will be authority and there will there will be ways to like legitimate that authority that's just going to happen it's all going to post hoc happen um and the thing that draw drew me to anarchism and that still calls to me like there's still like a huge call is like this rousseauian like people are cool and we can just be cool to each other and when when left to our own devices we will be be cool to each other yeah and i think for the most part that can be true I don't think it's necessarily true. Um, I also understand this more Habesian point of like, you know, where it is a war of all against all. Like I understand that too. And, and so- uh, That has to always remain in the conversation when we talk about, if we have the, the ideal of um, we can be cool to each other. Yeah. We know we are also afraid also, of each other. Yeah, we can also be fucked up to each other, which, uh levinas i think i think i think anarchists should read levinas mm -hmm. but they should do like a more robust reading dave warns people of becoming the doormat mm -hmm. and i think that's a valid warning i think you should listen to dave and i, I think without dave uh setting up that signpost for me mm. I, pro I probably would have fallen into the same doormat position but levinas is not about becoming a bitch mm -hmm. it, like it, it really is about um it's almost being like courageous enough for sure to say i'm gonna go against my inclination for war for sure that's how he says it in the yeah, preface yeah, yeah, i think yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. war war naturally limits our options it to like yeah, only it, one it way dis, it disallows it precludes it forecloses this mm. human congress mm -hmm. it stands in the way of it it puts us in this habesian state of war against war or all, war of all against all and yeah it, and, and that's where we are now, and, um, and we can have these kind of highfalutin Levinasian ideals, and I think we should, and we should allow those ideals to guide us, but we should also not start to think that those ideals are, are operative or operable in the world today. We need to change the fucking world today. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm also not trying to change the world today. I'm trying to understand the world today. I'm not ready. We're not ready to change the world. Yeah. If we... If we mm -hmm. All the awesome people who I love and I've just spent so much time with and I'm having all these conversations with and that I like I'm getting so much out of and if all of us came together and changed the world, it would still be a fucked up place because we're all still trying to get out of this structural stultification. We're all still trying to develop fully. But before we even talk about solutions, we need to build ourselves into the type of people, that, you know, like who could have valid solutions mm. or i i think i would say concurrently with because um okay we're never going to be ready no 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 no, no. yeah you're right you're right you're right, yeah. you're right it's like we're doing we have multiple uh things going at the same time yep, for sure and uh Burns and they're, help, they're helping each other yeah um which actually uh regarding this book uh bolo bolo, bolo. bolo um it's funny because it well it it has like different parts to it it's basically trying to lay out what could a uh, global world look like um if we wanted to change it if we didn't want the as they say the planetary work machine mm. <laughs> um and so uh some of the tactics are at your um you're like sabotaging the current world while at the same time trying to i think do something like build institutions or For build sure. practices dual power yeah like that. yeah so you're like you're decreasing the power of this world while trying to decrease increase the power of the new world yeah so that way it's not like a okay, after the revolution, we'll get around to building stuff. Yeah, it's, it's like we're, <laughs> we're, we're working for the future. Uh, well, pre prefigurative politics, right? Like yeah. We, we're, working, we're working to bring about the world that we want by working to create the world that we want. Mm -hmm. 
rather than just working to destroy the world that we currently have. You have to destroy the world that we currently have in order to have a new one, but you also have to build the new one. Yeah. <laughs> and if, like, if you allow a gap between the two, then you're fucked. Then it's full regression. Something, Something else, else will take its place. Something worse will take its place. <laughs> so yeah, building dual power concurrently with seeking uh, uh, revolution, I think, mm. is necessary. But but even that, I'm skeptical of. Mm. But uh, because I mean, it ha it there's limits. Just like there's Evan tells us there's limits to you know global capital, mm -hmm. which we can problematize. Um, there's also limits to mutual aid and and dual mm. power like there's limits to that as well and um yeah i feel like i should say um i've i haven't been convinced that anarchism could work mm. as a universalist project mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i honestly mm -hmm. think it's like it's for those people for who it resonates yeah but that's not most of the it's world. Not everybody, dude. Yeah, yeah. But in most fact, people... we are small. <laughs> no. if, if we if we identify ourselves as anarchists, and it's 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 a radical responsibility, rights and responsibilities. Sterner's fucking dope. I don't know if mm. you like Sterner, but I like Sterner. I haven't gone around to uh, Sterner my my Sterner book yet. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think a lot of people take sterner in the wrong direction and i'm definitely not a sterner expert but he became a meme yeah pretty quickly yeah but my my my, my sterner is different because my sterner talks about like you know personal responsibility and i'm mm. really into radical responsibility i'm you know i'm less concerned with egoism and individualism mm. like I, I still want some type of communitarianism mm -hmm. uh, or some some type of collectivity but you have to understand that this collective is is constituted of individuals mm -hmm. and the individuals have to be responsible and powerful mm. and efficacious so it is more about responsibility and stewardship and blah 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 but i think most people who are into stern are just like uh edgy memes mm. i think everybody mostly just like i think i i think i do too mm -hmm. probably everything i do is just i'm trying to be edgy edgy memes and some yeah <laughs> it's all bullshit dude yeah well, um, I wanted to bring up a thing about this book, Bolo Bolo, where its proposal for a new world, um, a new sci-fi world, is that um, instead of like specific cities or states, things that have like been set up not necessarily with anybody's intention in mind, like, or they kind of take on a life of their own, instead you have these things called bolos, and uh, they're roughly a population of 500 people, give or take, um, because, you know, that's kind of set as like the amount of people you can recognize within yeah. your little... Like uh, your extended Dunbar number. Yeah, exactly. Um, you don't know everyone's name, but you know that they are a part of your bolo. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, the book is proposing everyone gets to choose their bolo according to how they want to live their life, like how they want to have a shared life with those other people in their bolo. Um, and so the, he gives a bunch of examples. He's like, we could have a bunch of the following Alka Bolo, Sim Bolo, Les Bolo, uh, Sado Bolo, Maso Bolo. Marx Bolo, Anarcho Bolo, Mar Bolo. <laughs> uh, just as like examples of if you have, what if it was like a theory underground Bolo? Like enough people were like, I want to do this with my life. Yeah. And so if we can orient um, uh, this Bolo to only be about like, yeah, this stuff of like, we want to study theory then you structure your actual city well your bolo that way to be to always reinforce that value that yeah, shit. yeah 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 and people and people have the option of leaving bolos if they want to there's like there's almost like a nomadicism that's uh allowed in this new world too where you have to accept guests up to a certain like extent um and like they have to be cool Otherwise, like you're 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 allowed to like kick them out. Um, 
So it's a. Uh, I just want to get your thoughts of like, what is that kind of spark in your head of shared having having if you if we could actually create new territories and you could share it according to values what does that make you think of um i think again i think i think you said it i think that's fantastic for the people who are like predisposed to that but i think even that like universally wouldn't work because i mean there there are always going to be people who are just fucked up and do fucked up shit mm. i mean regardless i think i think we have to be willing to accept that and may, maybe in the future we'll not have that problem but as it stands right now and i think for the foreseeable future even if we solved all the you know structural problems there would still be fucked up people doing fucked up things mm -hmm. it does take into account there are like viking type people yeah. in this new world yeah. who just want to like come Watch in it up. yeah um i'm not sure if it actually gives a a strong reason why that wouldn't eventually uh, I mean, I think... be a downfall i think it's assuming that this new world is uh um it's going to be hard to to hoard resources yeah no and i, th I think yeah like without Without certain structures like states that legitimate hordes, mm -hmm. I think it would be hard. But I also think those things were innovated in the in history. Yeah, like there was a point in history where states were innovated. There was a point in history when hordes had to forge their own le legitimation. Mm -hmm. And like now, you know, we're living in the wake of history. But I, I don't see why it wouldn't happen again. Yeah. I, like, I, I know that I, I am too idealistic mm. when I think, like, oh, if we solve all the world's problems, then people will heal themselves. Mm. I think that, largely. Mm. And I know that that is incongruent with reality. I know mm. that's not the world we live in. That's the world in my head. Mm -hmm. And so I have to, like, be able to, to say... Yeah, I, I want that to be true, but I, I just, I know it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, but I, like, I think, I think allowing for a plurality, mm, like, yeah, I yeah. just think, I think maybe, um, maybe we have to accept the fact that will never succeed in like universal emancipation. Mm. Maybe we just have to accept the fact like, like we're not free until we're all free. Mm -hmm. This is my standpoint. Maybe we'll never all be free. Mm. So maybe none of us will ever to be free. And maybe that's true. And, and maybe it's been yet it's been, um, it hasn't been proven in history yet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think, I think um, new, new social and political technologies are necessary because I do think, like, change is a coming. Mm. Whether, like, whether we like it or not, the oh, yeah. climate change is, is going to drastically affect government politics social organization social coordination like it's it's just it's going to happen so i think it's necessary um i just think i hope i die before it matters <laughs> to me legitimately yeah like, i think um i think we'll only start to see like the drasticness of mm -hmm. it by the end of our lives yeah yeah and i i think i think i have to take up a position of let someone else worry about it mm. i'm not the one who can worry about it i am the one who right now is doing this critical media theory experiment and working on new ways of organizing and new ways of study and research and new ways of articulation and um new ways of kind of situatedness like that's what i'm doing i did you know i found myself here and, and this is the project that i'm swept up in um and I think that's pretty fucking radical. And I, and I think that, that, has, that has to satisfy the... We're not doing anything radical here. We're not. It's not radical. 
other than um, <laughs> ra- you know a radical a radical humanism. Mm. Somebody was talking shit about me last night. I was saying I'm I'm a humanist. Oh, you're fucking you're an imperialist. Ooh. Fuck you, dude. What does humanism mean? I don't know. But but I I think that's it. Like maybe I'm, you're for the human. I'm for the human. And you're we're trying to figure and out. I'm trying to figure out what that means. Yeah, that is my position. Yeah, genuinely. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and yeah, and that's it. And and that is kind of satisfying the the little radical inside my head, mm. who's saying the world's on fire, the sky is falling. Do something. Do something. Do something. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm doing something. Yeah. And, and I do believe that if we can succeed and, and if we can kind of create structures and frameworks and technologies for people to f- more further develop, maybe not fully develop, but like become better subjects, become more mm. like enriched subjects, political subjects and split subjects mm. and, and like just in general, like if, if we can provide a, a richer milieu for our children to grow up in and their children and and like the future humans Mm -hmm. to have a better chance um yeah i think that's all that can be done right now and i think it it is important for people to be talking about and experimenting with social and political technologies but Mm -hmm. i don't have the bandwidth for it anymore Mm -hmm. and i i used to really like to think about it but it it just i think it's impossible Mm. right now so i want to work to try to see if we can make a world where it becomes possible Mm -hmm. but also that's probably bullshit like that's probably like a bullshit line that i'm saying to like wash myself of the culpability Mm. there probably is something more that I could be doing probably definitely not even probably there's a hundred percent more I could be doing and I'm just too lazy dude <laughs> I don't know I don't know I, I I I get really bummed out when it comes to to like these questions because mm. I do think we're fucked mm-hmm. and I think all we can do is is like shock the system Mm. And then create new structures and kind of create a foundation for the future. Because the future right now is in free fall. And, and we are stealing from the future to kind of fuel the fire that's, that's running the engine of today. All this consumption, all this waste, all this death. And um, I, 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 I think this experimenting with education and and coordination Mm. i think is a project that is worthwhile and efficacious and that i'm suited to Mm -hmm. i think um i mean yeah the only maybe not the only but what i've kind of come to as a possible thing to do is not to focus on uh the world at large yeah um, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah because yeah i think as as we kind of um as mul- multiple of us keep suggesting um there's not really anything that we can do about it yeah um but i guess the thing that i feel uh still positive about with the future is something like what's laid out in this book, Retro Suburbia. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, look, it's just like a bunch of happy people riding bikes. <laughs> I resent them. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is an Australian book, so mm. definitely a different context, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, this is, I mean, this guy, he identifies himself as an anarchist. Um, oddly enough, which a lot of permaculture people don't yeah. don't really like, because <laughs> permacultures can come off as like the um, old white lady yep. retired who yep. wants to like have a, a really extensive garden. Yep. <laughs> but this guy, he's kind of just suggesting like um, 
like kind of focus focus on like what you could do in your home uh not first and foremost but like that's kind of like your starting point Mm -hmm. it's like think about what you do in your life how you you work with your family um uh and then how maybe you could even like uh work with other households who are doing kind of similar things um i don't know just honestly like does does anyone is there a bad thing about uh people starting gardens in their backyards um i feel like it's it's a it seems like such a uh small insignificant thing but i feel like it actually just brings some kind of peace to people Mm. and uh and and it's like yeah as as a like an action towards the the larger like uh global motions that are happening it is insignificant yeah but but if nine billion people did it then it wouldn't be insignificant yeah Yeah. that but also like um maybe it's something like kind of coming back to like what are the human scale Mm -hmm. problems we can actually work on as well human that i guess that's something i've taken away from learning about a bunch of anarchist stuff is um i enjoy the anarchists who embrace the human scale yeah part of living as think, much as possible yeah i think that's for me what was so hard with anarchism is that it, it was always it was always global mm. i mean the same thing with communism like proper communism yeah, proper that's anarchism just, that's like it's just hard it's always global you always yeah. have to well and they say think globally act locally but like it's just it's like this is impossible we're we're no this it i can't i can't maybe i'm fucking lazy stupid selfish whatever deficient maybe that's true but either way i can't i just don't have the energy to do this anymore i can't care about everything anymore i can't care about the global south and the inner city and like i I, 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 ah my head's going to explode so so doing this kind of returned to like the immediate world around you and trying to make the immediate world around you a better place i think is the virtuous choice for the anarchist Live, um, live locally theorize for sure u- universally yeah no abs- <laughs> yeah absolutely but uh i think it it always just gets jumbled up and it always winds up failing mm-hmm. um but also there are people who dave's mom is a fucking amazing farmer mm. like she's doing amazing dope shit where like she's she's taking ownership of the land and really doing permaculture yeah um but like, I'm sure there are people who would recognize that as some weird, stupid reactionary project of mm. or like, and it's just insane that like when when you do reduce from like the global fucking action to the personal, and you're like, well, I can't change that, so I'm gonna work on this, mm-hmm. and you and you start to act individually. Mm. People accuse you of being like a reactionary because mm. because you're. You're worrying about what you can change. Yeah. And it's, it's like, well, if we all worried about what <laughs> we could change, then I'm all in for anarchism. Yeah. But fucking well, anarchists can't figure it out. Dude. Well, we have to remember the split subject. Yeah, there of we go. Humans, there we go. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the Hobbesian part of humans. Yeah. And if we, oh, if we forget that, and we're always going to be like, why can't people be better? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Fucking stupid bitch ass people, dude. <laughs> Hate you guys. Yeah. So, but it's a it's a project of compassion. I I mean, for me is, um, trying to do what I can for my life, yep. my immediate surroundings, trying to remain always challenging myself to a compassion Mm -hmm. towards other people's contexts, seeing like what they could do in their own daily life. Uh, And then theorizing um, things that are happening on larger scales. Cause uh, well, one, it's fun. Yeah. We we get our, we get our, 
our jouissance. jouissance man. We, yeah. yeah, we get our rocks off on this shit. Yeah. But also, there is something about thinking that big feeds back into yep. our own little our own little slice of the pie of our our lives. For sure. Um, did you want to bring up another your your own anarchist uh how, how you came to that stuff and and where you stand now because i think i think i've heard you say that you i think i'm an anarchist and then now you but you're saying like but i still have like no i think this anarchist I, thing i think i am an anarchist like i think i've always been an anarchist but i think i'm i think i'm the only true anarchist <laughs> Um, and I think maybe every anarchist thinks they're the only true anarchist, mm. or maybe every older anarchist thinks that. I think maybe younger anarchists think that you know, well, people are basically good, so we can we can all do this and figure it out. And then I think once you become older, um, you come into contact with the split nature of of the human, and and you realize, no, mm. if if only everybody thought the way I think. Mm then all the problems would be solved. But if, of course it wouldn't. If everybody thought the way I think, we would all have killed each other mm. by now. Like fucking, I would hate to, I, I would hate to be stuck in a room with me for as long as you've been stuck in a room with me today. Nine I billion I, answers. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't. There's, there's three billion of them here on YouTube. <laughs> I couldn't stand another six billion more, but um, no, I, I, I think for me, it, it like coming out of the punk rock scene, Bands like Propagandi, um, Finding Kropotkin, Pradon, and Bakun, and before Finding Marx, like Finding Marx mm. by way of Pradon, poverty mm. philosophy, the philosophy of poverty, like, um, yeah, I, I think I was just like a, a, a herding child who was in a free fall, and mm. I found anarchism as a kid. And it, it comforted me, but it also made me believe that there was more than the, the shitty world I was living in. Um, and I think anarchism got me through my teenage years. Mm. Um, and then I got a little older. I had kids. I, I became a father at 16. Um, which, that got me through my late teens and my early 20s. Mm-hmm. Um, and then economically, I had to make a lot of tough choices and I had to kind of give up on mm. young idealist Nance, right? There, there was a young idealist Nance who thought he was powerful and thought he could change the world. Um, but you know, seeing my, at the time wife and children hungry mm -hmm. and, you know, needing a house, uh, it, like that that immediate problem was more important yeah than children in africa than the global south it was and um i think it's 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 insane that a lot of young anarchists become gross and start to like accuse people of of being like reactionaries and fascists and shit when all they're trying to do is feed their children mm. um but i had to kind of like sever ties and it's fucked up because I was when we were talking to Doug Lane. I told him like I, like he was talking about the millennial left, and I was like, "Don't talk for me." Like I, I was maybe a millennial leftist, right? And I did protest Iraq, and then I went and fought in Iraq because mm -hmm. the poverty draft is real, and that was my only option was to sign up to go shoot at young idealistic teenagers in Iraq. Mm -hmm. That's who we were fucking fighting, teenagers. Me, I was I was fighting me. You know. Uh, the tables have turned, right? I was a, a disgruntled, idealistic teen in America, and I went to Iraq and, you know, was confronted with young, disgruntled, idealistic teens over there who were taken advantage of by grifters, older fucking assholes who thought they were revolutionaries. And that, all that shit did come out of a, a liberation movement, hmm. right? The Cold War, I mean, like, that's also also the scary thing about universalism is. I mean, it's a it's a little bit of a shoehorn for, for a lot of sure, people. <laughs> dude. Um, but yeah, I mean, I gave up on everything. Um, but it, you know, I got out of the army and life 
blah, 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 blah. Um, thought of myself as a trot, essentially, for a while. I, I found my way to Posadism. Um, and I, th I, think I'm, I think I am a Posadist. I think I'm still some kind of anarchist. Um, and I think maybe that's unintelligible. Maybe that's incongruent. I don't think so. Mm. I, th I think... Uh, I think the Posadists were... Which is an evolution of basically trots. Okay. Um, like it, it, but, but yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I just reached a point where, like, uh, my struggles in, individuated me to the point where I had to, like, give up on everything. Mm. And so I, like, I still thought, or I was still kind of maintaining, like, oh, I'm going to be able to read theory and I'm going to be able to, to, be the smart understander guy and i'm really into philosophy and i'm really into deconstruction and i'm really into this and that and i think you know maybe maybe i can do something cool or worthwhile or whatever and i really do think pouring myself into parenting was a good thing like i think my kids are dope and i think they would be less dope had i not gone about parenting the way i went about parenting and obviously I made two huge mistakes. Which parent doesn't? Um, for sure. Um, but no, it, it, you know, and then again, within the last few years, I guess I'm finally like reawakening from the stupor of work. Yeah. Um, and attempting to re-engage in uh, global thinking, maybe. Mm. But I've got uh, a, a lot more experience and a lot more understanding and a lot more poise and a lot more mm -hmm. patience. So I do still think like, yeah, I think, I think I am some kind of anarchist. Mm. Um, but I would have 14 hours worth of caveats and qualifiers. Yeah. So I, it's not worth saying that. Yeah. That's kind of the thing about saying a position of like, yeah. I am this because then really you only get to it when you have a conversation with someone yeah. about like oh okay so this is what that term means to you that you're identifying with what does it mean to you it doesn't matter what it means to me like if, exactly. if i'm trying to to explain something to you it doesn't matter what i mean mm -hmm. it matters what you understand yeah um and that's a problem endemic to language itself but the medium accelerates it so building, well, and also identifying yourself with <laughs> doing it. this exact one-to-one -one identification <laughs> yeah. yeah but we do that because there's not this space for understanding and mm -hmm. we are forced to we are forced to live as if we are commodities because in fact we are just commodities mm -hmm. because capital is determining our fucking our mm -hmm. our possibilities capital is determining our field of possibilities and the state and you know, but capital, capital is the fucking problem. Mm. Like, you do need to read Marx, but maybe you don't need. To. I, well, shut the fuck up. Anyway, <laughs> um, we 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 behave as as commodities because commodities have to be this kind of one to one direct identification. It has to be intelligible and understandable mm. and exchangeable. And I can't ex exchange a negativity with you. I can't exchange uh, uncertainty. It has to be certain for it to be exchanged. And because we have to act as if we are commodities, because guess what? We are commodities until we open up space by creating robust, resilient, long-lasting relationships where, the negative, where we can incorporate negativity. We can incorporate mm. a lack of understanding. We can incorporate nuance and complexity. And we can incorporate future projections. And we can even incorporate our histories. Because if I have some kind of bad habit from the past like from my habitus from my lived experience but you, we still both have to do work to incorporate that mm. like if there's someone who does something that rubs you wrong or you don't like or, or annoys you or whatever mm -hmm. but you nevertheless manage to have like a constructive relationship you're giving them grace mm -hmm. and you're forgiving them their past and hopefully you're creating a space where they can unlearn the behavior but they can't do that in this world where everything is this direct one-to-one -one commodity. You're just like, mm. fuck that guy. That guy sucks. 
I don't have time for that guy. And it's unfortunate. There are a lot of times where we just don't have time for that guy. And if you've been that guy, sorry, dude. I've been that guy before many, many times. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I will be that guy in the future. But like it really is about (laughs) creating spaces for these negativities to unfold because that's what humans are. We are a negativity. That's why I say I'm a humanist because Mm. the the human question to me is a negativity. There isn't a satisfactory answer. Mm. That's my negativity. That's my space. That's the tension I'm holding. And that's the project I'm working on. And I think it, I think it, uh, it goes hand in hand with social coordination, value coordination, exchange, social technologies, political technologies, all the things that we're doing and all the things in these books. Like I think all those political and social technologies in those books are predicated on a robust humanity. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And we're not there yet. Mm-hmm. So, but again, a, a, a robust humanity. Or oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, but but again, that's also probably all bullshit. Mm. Like that's probably all just a slick line that I came up with to justify my own inability to to change the world. Because at, at the end of the day, I do want to change the world. Because mm. the world is broken. I don't think it's up for a human though to mm. to do that. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't think we need to give ourselves that kind of uh, um, grounding <laughs> to Based. change the world. Based. Because we can't. Yeah. So, which, I mean, I think ultimately that makes me in some ways something kind of apolitical. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think about politics. I well, don't like do apolitical politics. on the global scale. For sure. For I sure. Think, I think I think a lot more about what are politics in my immediate this is important bolo number yeah, yeah, of yeah. like the 500 people that yeah. i probably could actually affect yeah. in my lifetime that's important man and i'll be yeah. honest with you that's something that i i lack there mm. i'm probably not gonna vote this year mm-hmm. it's just too hard I, it it's too hard for me yeah now. i gave my ballot to my dad uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no we're fucked uh, voter fraud <laughs> No, I mean, uh, I actually just posted a note on Substack today. I was like, I I was going to vote. I was committed to down ballot. Mm -hmm. But then they kept calling me and they kept texting me and they kept emailing me. They even Mm -hmm. came to my door. Yeah. And because I'm a petty bitch, now I'm not going to. Now I'm not even going to vote down ballot, but I probably will. Um, (laughs) Congress, you know, Gallego, like I I probably will. Mm -hmm. But I'm definitely not going to vote for president. Fuck Mm -hmm. that. But, you know, the local... The local is is important. Yeah, so it's like where you you might actually be able to like mm-hmm. do change. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I don't even think voting voting is only one method of all these other methods we could use for politics in our. I call it like daily life world. Yeah, you know, it's like the people daily life world. Hell yeah, yeah. like the people you actually see. Like at the store or whatever, yeah. or like the people in your neighborhood, you don't know their name, but you know that they live close to you. Yep. Um, there's there's ways that we could actually do things um, where it, it might make their life just a little bit better. Yeah. It, maybe a little bit less stultifying. Yeah. Um, but it takes it takes the theorizing to know how do we what are those ways we might be able to do that where does it seem like uh there's a lot of contingencies yeah. being able to do that right um so it's really just being open to questioning ourselves um and our influence um not feeling like we got it yeah we know the answer <laughs> there are no answers Sometimes it feels like we're throwing spaghetti noodles at the wall. I think, yeah, I think largely that, that that's <laughs> that's it. That's been it for the history of, you know, politics. I think it's all bullshit. Mm. But I think people have people have made valiant efforts. Yeah, but uh, but it's it was. I still like the Studebaker thing of the non-reformist reform. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> that's the only. It's like, ooh, okay, I could I could see your point there. Dude. That's the only motherfucker I want to talk to you about <laughs> politics is Benjamin fucking Studebaker. Yeah. We, because we, I can get behind non-reformist reforms because it yeah. does impact, like it does actually impact what's going on in the world around you. If, if your neighbors are less retarded mm. because they have access to education and healthcare, 
um, then they could probably make better choices. I can get behind that. Dude, that's, uh, we kind of cornered Studebaker in the kitchen, like, one night, um, like, me and Sean, and uh, Sean brought up, he's like, I want you to just go off on telling me about Plato, Plato's idea of democracy. Yeah, dude. And, like, he would have probably kept us there longer than an hour if it wasn't, or we were just, like, tired. Um, but he, he was bringing up this point of, like, Plato's idea of democracy or like politics is almost as a little bit of like a libidinal economy thing where mm. Plato thinks that your political players, your political like citizens in your government, in your world, um, they should know the difference between like uh, something like necessary virtues and like unnecessary virtues. I'm not sure if it is virtues, but basically kind of knowing like what are the good pleasures of like the the, the things to cultivate yourself. Of, yeah, like, yeah, to yeah. be more educated, to do yep. time energy stuff. And then what are those that we tend towards naturally as humans where we can be greedy if we just only want to think about business Um or like we only want to like enjoy pleasure in like that traditional like hedonist way. Yeah. Um, and it's like, oh, even Plato, uh, well, Benjamin was kind of illuminating for us that even Plato kind of has his criticisms of democracy, but in a way where it is maybe tying into like, because it doesn't cultivate yeah. the individual enough. Well, and that like his shit with uh, like, if you, if you have uh, contact with the market, yeah, you, then, you, then you you can't participate in, in <laughs> politics. Yeah, because you think about market yeah, stuff too much. Homo economicus is retarded. Yeah, market logic breaks your brain and breaks your understanding of humanity itself. At least it what Plato th thinks. Yeah, uh, I think it too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, fight Studebaker is dope, dude. Yeah, uh, he's great, and yeah. I think I think him talking about the good is maybe what started my long slow descent back into a uh, humanism. Like him <laughs> him positing the notion of the a good. Descent. <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah. apparently like people fucking talking shit about it. Like fuck you people, dude. I don't know why it p pisses people off so much that I want to say I'm a humanist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I also well, like, I guess there is that tradition of humanism. That's bullshit. And, and then, yeah. uh, uh, Fuck you, I'm taking the, the word back. The human. Yeah. yeah. So, but I, I don't know enough about, like, yeah. I, I, I fully get it, man. And yeah. I, the, the reason for me it's a thing is because I was that guy. And I was like, yeah, human is actually a fucked up word and we shouldn't use human. Mm -hmm. And I'm an anti humanist. I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a this, I'm a that. Whatever, dude. Fuck you guys. Give it the program. Read a book. Sorry, I'm not trying to be mean. You're just you're just a uh, uh, free associating. I'm free associating. Yeah, we're all idiots. I'm I'm just as big an idiot. I'm probably bigger than um, the fake idiot in my head that I'm yelling at when I start to go off and and tell people fuck you. That's mm -hmm. a fake person, and it's probably a projection of myself. Because mm -hmm. I I mean I was. And a lot of the time I am railing against my younger self mm. and like wishing I could go back in time and grab the younger version of me, smack me and say, you're a fucking idiot. Mm. Um, I've had this idea. I don't know if it's a essay or if it's a panel discussion or whatever form it to, to draw out it's um the stories but something like <laughs> i almost want there to us to do like a theorizing of letters to young people yeah, or like letters sick, to dude. younger self that'd be sick something like that because it's like i don't know i think there are there's something that you kind of like want to communicate to like a younger self yeah dude you know um and realizing that sometimes there are like younger like how i've been influenced by people 
who are just doing their own projects like podcasts or books or whatever and they have never met me mm-hmm. I, I will never meet them mm-hmm. but because they were talking about this is what my younger self i'm sensitive to my younger self when i'm talking yep. from this position that um you you take that as as someone who's young and is like oh okay like maybe this that's kind of like how i want to be when i'm older is yeah, like be be like that or like have that lesson um i don't know i think it's just also an interesting exercise to share something if you could share something with that part of you that was younger oh yeah i would say buy bitcoin <laughs> i would say um <laughs> do less drugs mm-hmm. take, take better care of yourself yeah and you are not the smartest person in the world mm. and also i would give that guy a hug and say it'll be okay mm. and on that note i think i think that's a, a pretty good wrap up i think i might take this last hour and a half or so and uh just p- publish it as a standalone video clip it because uh, I like it a lot. Anarchism and why it, it won't work. Parentheses. But also we still why like it. we still like it. <laughs> why I, Dave just published why I'm not a leftist or some shit. I should publish why I'm still an anarchist mm. with Cesar. Why, why, why we're still anarchists and fuck you. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I don't think I ever really like sip the kool-aid enough or like drank the kool-aid enough to say i am anarchist word but I w- i've been sipping from <laughs> from that like uh punch bowl for so long um that someone looking from across the room is like uh i don't think you're microdosing anymore yeah <laughs> i think you're fucking frying balls <laughs> but it's always like sips it's like and then I take a break, you the, know? The principle. I, I never go full full dose. Yeah. And then when it kind of wears off again, a little bit of sip again. The, the principled anarchist. <laughs> we, should write, we should write a book called The Principled Anarchist, and it would be letters to our younger selves. Yeah. But, um, yeah, dude, I think that's a good spot. And I, I do think this last hour and a half on anarchism will probably be mm. a separate video from the, the TU yeah. con. But I mean, it'll all stay up in one piece for the VOD. If anybody wants to go back through and watch the whole thing, I uh, mm-hmm. I think it was good. So sorry, thank you for joining me. We'll meet up um, and do more. We'll do more Levinas readings. We'll talk more about projects and all that stuff. And uh, hopefully for next TU Con, we can like do it up big style something i don't know mm. go up fucking go up together and i, I don't know Duh, this first this first t yukon was dope um but we also learned a lot of lessons yeah and mm-hmm. and you were a part of that and thank you for being a part of that i'm excited for the next one and i'm excited for all the other shit we got going on so is there anything else you want to fucking say to the youtube before we bail? um other theorists i'm coming for you mm-hmm. i'm coming to your town coming to a city near you <laughs> Yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> All right. Peace out. Uh, peace the fuck out, YouTube. Hold on. Did I make a little? Peace out, motherfucker. Uh, uh, hold on. Let's make a funny voice.